Hey you guys, howdy, <laughs> and good morning or afternoon or evening wherever you are. In fact, please sign in. Let's see where you guys are. I want to see where you guys are in the world. I see a bunch of you are out there, but I don't know who's there. I know Jared's there, but sign in. Tell us where you are. We're going to have a, our special guests here in a minute. We're uh, coming to you from Carmel, California, where it's currently very foggy and overcast. That's our summer here. Uh, we have a little spot uh, spot hey, time. <laughs> and good morning. I'm Whoa, where did that come from? Okay. I think that came from Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, you're playing back my video. Okay. Well, listen, let's just get started here and we'll have some fun. There's Yvette. Hi, Yvette in London. Okay. Yeah, there's Dan signing in. So we're going we're gonna to bring you guys all on. Just, by the way, um, tell us where you are. Hey, Joe, checking in from Louisiana. I bet it's hot and buggy there. So um, as we go through, too, don't hesitate to add your questions so Dan can address those. Hey, Jesse, greetings from Finland. That's so awesome. And by the way, yes, hit the like button. That does help people find the show. So that's always a handy thing. And subscribe. Uh, yeah, I'm going to hit that in a second. So okay. <laughs> well, I'll do it. Go ahead right now. Go mm -hmm. ahead and subscribe. Thank you, Jared. I always forget to do this. And enable the bell so you don't miss any of our shows. Okay. Hey, more people signed in. Eric, Penelope. Hi, Penelope. You're not very far from me. And uh, okay, so listen, let's get started. I'm Mark Silber, photographer, author, educator in Carmel, California. And I'm going to bring you this show. We are sponsored by our friends, not at YouTube. Uh, let's get the right screen here. There we go. We are partially sponsored by our friends at YouTube. But Bay Photo Lab... Now listen, you've heard me talk over and over about getting things into print, but a cool thing popped up this morning. They have a super high-end drum scan. It's this Tango scanner, and I'm actually going to be using it. Uh, I've scanned tons of my negatives, but I keep finding ones that I haven't. So you can get 20% off. Take your best negatives if you guys have negatives, and some of you don't, but if you have negatives, turn them into high-end scans because you can use them digitally and you can do different things with them. 20% off on those. This is a really good system, and uh, I, I really recommend it. Because one thing you want to do if you scan your stuff, you want it to be good. You can also get, uh, as always, 25% off on your first order. Do something, make something in print, get some prints on your wall, get some negatives scanned. But whatever you do after the show, go over to Bay Photo and, and grab one of their deals here. And you can uh, listen, that's the best way to share your work. Put it into a print, make it into a print. Okay, and with that note, here we are with our friend Dan Milner, all the way from Sag Harbor. New York. Dan, welcome back to AYP. Yes, I'm here after a nice long van trip across the country. Yeah. And uh, happy to be here in New York. And uh, it's a bit hot. It's a bit muggy here as well. And uh, But yes, I'm inside. I've been prepping 24 hours. I've been carbo loading for this podcast. And uh, I think it's I'm amazing, ready. Isn't it? All yeah, right. Just well, we talked about this a while ago about uh, getting, you know, basically getting some tips out, information about how to go to print, which is so important. You and I talk about it all the time. So should we just dive in? I know you got a list. Why don't we dive in? Let's see what you. Yeah, got. I do have a list, and okay. the list may be uh, the list may be slightly outside the bounds of what you might think a list would be. It's kind of, I, th I equate this list to what people equate how, the, how to learn photography and they think things like got to get the best camera, got to get all that, really has not much to do with learning photography. Um, and I think bookmaking is a little similar. So I kind of want to go out in front what you would be contemplating and thinking about even before you start to go to print, whether you're making a single print or a magazine or a book or anything else. I think okay. these are uh, things that you have to keep in mind. And uh, number one, point number one. 
this, what are you holding in your my, hand there, by the way? Are you going to reveal it? Okay, there we go. This is what I write in every day. I love it. Um, and I also write letters. Amazing. Got a couple of letters. They still, you and still I do, do that. I do Polaroids. These are from the Fuji Instax Square uh -huh. that I got, which is amazing because you can punch images out of your phone or whatever else you shoot with whatever camera goes to the phone, goes to the Fuji Instax printer, which is really nice. I'm going to use nice. that for my workshop coming up. Nice. Um, step number one is to take a deep breath. That is point number one. Take a deep breath and remember, this is supposed to be fun. I have seen so many people go down the rabbit hole of turning of basically making bookmaking into some absolutely stressful endeavor where they feel like that every they're being judged and everything is on the line. And a lot of people who've never made a book before or never made prints before put these this insane amount of pressure on themselves to try to produce something perfect the first time they sit down to try to make something. And I think making a perfect book is is basically unrealistic for anyone let alone somebody who's just getting started making prints or making books. I mean, if you just look at material choices alone, let's say that you want to make inkjet prints. If you just look at material choices alone, whether it's inkjet papers, surfaces, weights, what printer are you going to use? What size are you going to print? All of those things can be completely overwhelming. So just take a deep breath and realize of all the stuff that we have to do as human beings on a daily basis, whether it's deal with COVID or pay taxes or whatever it is, that's the kind of stuff that you get stressed about. Making prints and making books and magazines should be fun. And it's just something to keep in mind. It's, it's a mindset because I've run into many photographers over the years who basically have alienated themselves and really made everyone around them miserable because of their obsession over putting something into print. And yes, printing is important. I think it's, it's what I would call going full circle with your work is going from concept to capture to print. I think that's sort of a logical circle as a photographer, but most of the people around you are not going to care at that level. And so you just have to keep it in perspective. Um, the other thing breath. too, I like that. Take a deep breath. And I think the secondary part of this is that bookmaking or printmaking is a separate language that contains many different dialects. And if you just take bookmaking, for example, you've got your editing, your sequencing, your page design, your typography, your material choices, your trim size, your volume that you're going to print in, your printing technology, whether it's POD or offset. You have all of those decisions and each one of those categories is a separate dialect. So you might speak English, but I don't speak like the same English that the Irish speak or the great or the folks in Britain speak. We have different accents, different dialect, different dialects. We use different terminology. And so each one of those categories, like for me, I studied photojournalism. I got a degree in photography, but I had no design training whatsoever. So when I started to make prints and make books, I was catching up because I was like, I don't know anything about typography. I don't know anything about page design. I don't know about book materials or paper types or end sheets or any of that stuff. So I had to take my time and learn it. And I think that underlying concept of just taking a deep breath and saying, look, I need to just enjoy the process of learning all these things and keep the process fun because happy bookmakers tend to make good books unhappy, stressed out bookmakers tend to make things that don't live up to their expectations. And then it makes it worse for everyone because then they, you know, we all know what that's like. You, you kind of miss on something and then you spend the next four weeks online complaining about it. We all do it. People <laughs> don't deny it. We're, yeah. We've all been there. Yeah. Happy bookmakers. That's what we want. I love it. Yes. Printmakers. All right. Are you ready? Are you ready for point two? I am. Point two is also out in front of the process. Point two is the DAM point, the digital asset management. So one of the questions I've had a thousand times in the last 10 years is how on earth can you make so many books? I've made 240 books with Blurb alone. Dang. That doesn't include, doesn't include MagCloud. It doesn't include all the other companies that I've used. 240 with blurb. I'm not saying those are all good books, not by a long shot, but I made them all. And the, the, the same, I give the same answer every time someone asks that. And the answer is because I have a system in place. 
And the system starts with good digital asset management, which in layman's terms means where the heck are my images? How do I find them and how do I retrieve them to put in a book? And so your digital asset management system has to be in place. Whatever path you choose to go with digital asset, that could be using Capture One, it could be Lightroom, it could be Photoshop, whatever system you have, LumaFusion or whatever else is out there, you have to determine your system and stick with it. So when the time comes to make a book, you are not searching for images you are not having to tweak those images. You are not having to export or do anything because the images are already ready to go. Yeah. That is a, I would say that is a third of the battle. Mo I would say a, a, at least a third of the people that I encounter who have trouble that said, I haven't been able to pull off the book thing yet is because they don't have a handle on where their images are. And so when I go to make a book, what I do is when I import images into Lightroom, I, I make my edit and I, we're going to get to editing in a minute. I am merciless when it comes to the edit. I, there is no fat in my edit. There's no extraneous stuff. So I know how to edit. And then those images are labeled and they are tweaked and they are exported ready to go to print so that when I get a moment to make a book, I don't have to do any of that. All I have to do is import those images and I start building the book. Uh, Peter Crow. Let yeah, me ask right. you two things. So it's impor important differentiation between editing and processing, first of all. Oh, yeah. So you're talking about editing, which means? So I'm going to get to editing in a minute. That's my. Uh, OK. That is my third point. OK, cool. So we'll get to that. But the question, I, one of the questions I you brought up something labeling. How do you label those images? Do you actually change so the file name or? And again, I mean, how the, the handling of files, there are, there are literally dozens and dozens of ways of doing this. And everybody has a system. And I wouldn't say that one system is better, better than the other. It's just whatever system that you happen to settle on, you want to maintain it so that you have a routine in place and that the digital asset management does, doesn't become an obstacle. It just becomes part of the process. Yeah. So what I do is I, I, I do not throw any images away ever. I keep every single frame that I shoot because when you go to make books, oftentimes you're going back to those collections of images and you're pulling things that you didn't initially think you would need. So throwing away images to me is an amateur hour methodology. I, I don't know good professionals that throw work away because, and, and there are famous stories through photographic history of photographers who didn't throw things away, who ended up basically finding career changing, life changing imagery because they didn't throw things away. Dirk Halstead is a name that comes to mind. If you want to look up that story, it's a pretty, pretty incredible story about the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Um, mm. And he, he remembered seeing her face, didn't know who she was, hired a researcher, went back through his archive of, of transparencies and found the image uh, of that situation, which of course was a, you know, that image is probably sold hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of sales for that one single image. That's what you right. get for not throwing your stuff away. So I don't throw anything away. What I do is I go through and I make a very basic assessment and I label one star the images that I think are going to be selects or edits. Mm -hmm. um, I am very, very careful about my starring system. Very, uh, maybe once or twice a year, maybe I would have a five star image, but most of the time everything is down in the one star, two star range. Um, and then those images are, um, the file name is, I have my own labeling system for the file name. And again, there's a million ways to do that. Um, and then those images are exported out into the size that I would need for making the publication that I want. Um, and that has the, the editing is, is a whole separate thing. And that's what, that's what point three here is, is understanding whether you're making a single print or a book or publication is your edit is hold is the key to the whole thing basically it's it i would say it's a it's probably the single most important factor is the edit of what you pull the sequence would be the secondary uh part of that in terms of what order you put those images in but editing is an art form and i think what's happened and i saw this going back to the late 90s when digital technology began to arrive is i saw an almost immediate erosion of editing ability Whereas during the film era, when you put transparencies on a light box, you knew immediately whether an image worked or not. And when people edited, you know, we had full-time picture editors that we were working with on a regular basis. If you did an assignment, most often you were partnered with a full-time picture editor. 
that would help make sense of what it is that you were making. And when digital came along, most of those people either started to begin getting laid off or they were aging out and they weren't being replaced. And so you saw this erosion of editing skills. And the tricky part is digital is an amazing thing. Um, but like I can take this camera this afternoon and I have basically an endless amount of imagery that I can make. And for some weird reason, that has been touted as being a good thing that you can go into the field and shoot 10,000 photographs. And that is a terrible idea. Um, editing is really where you're, you're in control of who you are as a photographer. If you're a good photographer, there is no reason to shoot 10,000 frames in the field because there are simply not that many good moments happening around you. So you, you shoot tight in the field. And then when it comes to editing for your images or your publication, I think the easiest thing to do is to start with something like, what are the top 25 images? And then what are the, what are the best 10? What are the single best five images? And then what is the single most important image from a shoot? That is editing. So if you shoot a thousand images and you cull it to 500, that's not editing. Yeah, that is this, you know, that sloppy sloppiness that doesn't apply because, OK, now you have 500 images. If you're going to make a single print now, what are you going to do? So it's really um, and I was fortunate because when I came up in photography and I was working in the newspapers, typically a newspaper would only run a single image from from a story. Occasionally you get lucky. They would do a picture package, maybe three or four images total. But most of the time it was like, hey, every single day under pressure and deadline, you had to you had to determine what the single most important image was. And that is a whole separate skill. And if you don't have it, it just takes practice. You know, it takes throwing things down, making small prints, putting them on a table and then editing and figuring out what works best together. It's actually a really fun part of the process. So editing would be this would be number three. The tighter you edit, the better it's going to be. Um, if you've got great work, give it space in the publication and let it breathe. You don't need 20 pictures when one picture is going to tell the same story. And again, that's really about practice. When you stare, when you shoot images every day, year after year, and you, you are forced to edit those daily year after year, it's when you get good. Editing is just like photography or, or, or basketball for that matter. It's a skill that requires practice to get better. And making prints, like you said, even on a home inkjet, right? So that you can yep. get some some idea what this is going to look like as a printed image rather than a digital image. That's really important. Yeah, because print forces you to apply critical thought because you have to pay for it. So if you're going to make a print at home on your inkjet and you're looking at images and you shot a motorized sequence and you've got six frames in a series and you go, man, I, I guess I have to print all six of these. Well, you're gonna look at inkjet costs, the ink and the paper, the consumables and be like, man, I don't wanna print all six. So you have to choose. Um, I did a, a, a YouTube film yesterday that I released yesterday called Notes on Photography and I showed two images shot sequentially of the same scene, but they're very different and I sort of said this is the one that i would have chosen and here's why but this is really close like i can argue for both of these images but if i'm going to make a book or a publication for the most part i've got to choose i have to make a final decision as to which one of these sums up the story best because i don't need both of them right printing printing both of them sort of shows in some ways a lack of editing skill but also a redundancy that may or may not add to the actual narrative of the book and so again, it's, you know, good photo editors, when you see them in action, there are people who just do nothing but edit photographs all day long. They are simply at a level that is hard to comprehend in terms of how they're looking at, at photographs. I've, I've had it happen to me where people um, have edited my work in a way that I just never saw. I never put it together the way that they saw because I was too close to the photographs. I'm too close to the stories. Yeah. And I put it in front of a professional editor who doesn't have that attachment is just looking at content. And man, do they they take they, they can basically blow your mind with um, how they see your work. Yeah. And curators uh, for exhibits, the same thing, because if, if you're going to a gallery and they're intending to sell your work, for instance, they, they, they have an eye for that. You know, they know what, what will actually fit and work into a series or not. And they don't want a lot. They don't want fat in there. Well, the other thing, too, is di a, the different style of editors out there. So if you have a, a picture editor for Associated Press, 
that person is going to edit your work in one way. But if you have an, an agent that works in advertising photography, they will look at the same portfolio and choose and edit a completely different take. Yeah. Because a, a commercial editorial client or a commercial advertising client does not have the same desire as a wire service. And so that the first time I had a fr an agent friend edit my work, I could not believe the images that she chose. They just seemed like they were some of the least effective images. And she saw my face and she goes, you know, you're coming from the documentary world. I'm coming from advertising. She goes, they don't want documentary work. They want, they want that style of photography, but this is the kind of image they're after. And she chose things that I was just like baffled by. But sure enough, that's what they want. So I came from more of the wire service world and think with that mentality in mind. So you can take the same body of work and edit it a multitude of different ways, depending yeah. on your needs. And again, it's practice and, um, and also doing things like portfolio reviews are also really fun and educational because you put your work in front of these people and they show you all kinds of things about it that you might not have known or seen. Cool. Um, there is a subcategory of edit that I should probably touch on, which is when you go, and this, this could be its own separate point. When you go to make a book, it's very helpful to define what it is you are trying to make. Are you making a portfolio or are you making a book? Are you making a magazine? All those things will have an impact on the digital asset management. They will have an impact on the edit, the materials, all those kind of things. Because a narrative, a book has a story to it. And you may have to include images that are not beautiful, but they help tell the story. Whereas a portfolio might just be a 10 images total and they don't tell a story. It's just a sample of your best photographic work. Those are two publications with, with very different purposes. And because of those purposes, the edit will change. You know, what you don't want in a portfolio is any extraneous images because then the person looking at it is going to say, you don't know how to edit because you put a, you put two of the same image in, or you, you have images that are too similar and they're going to say up, oh, you probably don't know how to edit very well. Now with a book, with a narrative, you may have to put in a bunch of images that aren't portfolio level, but they're educational and they take the viewer on that narrative that you need them to go on. So right. defining what it is you want to make is really key. Um, the last uh, point number four is I think Irma Boom was the one who said this, which is the cover is designed last, but it's what makes the first impression. And so, I think doing your cover last is a good idea. I think you can mock one up. If you have an idea for what the cover is going to be up front, go ahead and mock it up. Don't spend too much time on it. Mock it up and then leave it and do the rest of the book and then come back and revisit. Yeah. I think oftentimes that first attempt at the cover is sometimes a bit on the obvious side and it, and it can stand to use a little refinement that comes over time. And when you've got the rest of the inside pages designed and you're ready, then go back and, ha and revisit that cover. And undoubtedly, and in my, with my books, the cover evolves at the, at the last, at the end, absolutely. There's no question. You're not gonna spend a lot of time designing the cover and then writing the book or putting the book together. So you're absolutely right. But it is good to have some starting point just as a placeholder sure. or nothing else. Yeah, good point. And the last point, and there's no way around this, um, whether you're gonna make a print or you're gonna make a book or you're gonna make a magazine, you have to be prepared to test. You have to make test prints. Mm -hmm. You have to make test books. You, you don't have to make the giant 100 page hardcover test book, but you better make a 20 page soft cover test book. Because if you think you're going to make one and think it's going to be perfect the first time out, you're probably going to be wildly disappointed because I don't know many people who can pull that off. The same with printing. And here's the funny part is when inkjet printing really arrived, which was mid 90s. That's when everybody started to buy desktop inkjet printers. The Epson EX, I think, was the first one that really, you know, and, and at that time, those printers, they weren't archival. The, the magenta ink would shift almost immediately. There were problems, but they were also awesome. We all knew how fun and great this was to have an inkjet printer. 
And so I had over the, the course of that following 10 years, I had photographer friends who were very famous, who ended up getting sponsored by everyone and everything. Their camera was sponsored, their printer, their inks, their profilers, um, their paper, everything was provided free of charge. And one of these guys was very, um, he was just a gem of a guy who was in incredibly generous. And anytime I got into a bind where I needed a print, I would go to his house and he would make prints for me, regardless of how big. If I needed 20 by 30s, he would print them without even batting an eye. But one of the things I noticed was he had every piece of equipment you could possibly have. He had the best color management system. He had the best calibration system. He had the best printers, the best ink, the best computers, the best everything. And we never nailed a print on the first try. Never. Even if it was like technically perfect, we always looked at it and said, we need to change some things. So on a, on a typical inkjet print, we might, we might make three or four test prints before we got to the print that we nailed. And the same exact thing applies to bookmaking or magazine making. Most of the time I make multiple test books before I get to the book that I actually want. And that's just par for the course. Every single good bookmaker I know does that. No one nails it on the first try. Um, and publishers often don't. That's why people go on press and they, you know, look at what's coming out of the presses and then they start making, you know, they do a proof print. Totally. A proof book. And then they tweak the presses. The yeah. artist comes in and says, oh, it's, a bit, it's too, too magenta, you know, add, add whatever. Add cyan, you know, I need to balance this out. And, we, and you refine and you test. So making a test book, not only should that not be stressful or, or viewed as a pain, that should be one of the best parts of the process because it eliminates all the stress of making anything. Because the only person who's going to see the test book is you. And you're just making one copy or the test print, you know, you, you're going to look at it and go, OK, I need to change this. I'm going to add magenta, you know, maybe it's not neutral, whatever. And then you tear up that test print or stick it in your journal like I would and write down the notes of what you did in it yeah. um, and then move on and make something else. Boom. You know, going back to our darkroom days, I mean, that was inherent in making a print you always oh. it was always a test print Ansel Adams there's a great video of him doing a test strip because you know he often printed enormous prints so he would print a section of it and then take it out to his kitchen and put it in the microwave to dry it because obviously it's going to look very different once it's dried but you're right, Dan, and the light that you're going to look at in, look at it in varies and, and how it's going to be viewed. Are you looking at it like this as a book? Or are you looking at it on the wall? And without testing it, you're just you're never going to get there. Yeah, the dark room was, you know, that was laborious testing. To your point, we used to do test strips. You take a single sheet of paper, cut it in small pieces, yeah. lay it through the part of the image that had the most primary elements. And then you did, you know, 20 seconds, 18 seconds, 16 seconds, 14 seconds, you know, did. And then you processed the test strip and then you took that out into the daylight and looked at it and made a, made a, a guesstimate. But no one nailed, really nailed anything on the first print in the dark room. And man, today, like making inkjet prints and making POD books is a piece of cake in comparison to the dark room. So I, yeah. I just find, you know, it's a bit odd that people have put, they look at test books in a weird way, like, Oh, I don't want to hassle with that. Or, oh, there's too much expense there. And I just think that that's not really realistic. I mean, there's plenty of people who've made a single copy with no test books who got it and said, yeah, this isn't perfect, but I don't care. I like it. That's totally fine. I've done that myself. I've made something where I'm just experimenting on a project and making a first, first uh, ditch thing. I just did this with my Death Valley project. I made a magazine that's horrible terrible there's i mean i looked at it and i was like oh this is embarrassing how bad this is but there were one or two things about it that i said that worked and i'll i'll continue that into the next next version of this but this first version i'm not showing to anyone because it's so lame and um that's just because i was moving fast and i was excited about the project and i wanted to put something into print and i did and i was like oh, it's just not good enough i gotta spend more time and do a better job and it, you really open the door to a much bigger 
topic here about testing is so important. I mean, in every art form you test, you music, you have a sound check. You can't just walk into an auditorium and expect to know what the acoustics are like, right? So yep. these guys test it. You're going to paint your house and you pick out colors. You've got to actually paint the paint the wall or paint the outside of the house with those various colors before you get it right. But in, yep. in, in creating books, also when you test it, it gives you a chance to see what it looks like, but also you can share it with others and get their response as well. That's, that's another part just, of this thing. Just think about the difference between, if you're gonna make a high-end blur photo book and you use the ProLine uncoated paper versus the ProLine coated paper, the difference between those two papers is considerable. And over the years, I don't know how many people have asked me, hey, which of those, what paper should I use? And if I can see their work and I see what their other printed projects look like, I can typically give them direction as to which surface they would probably most appreciate. But for the most part, like I can't tell people what paper to use because it's a subjective thing. And those two yeah. papers are very, very different. And so until you see your own work printed in a little 20 page soft cover, one on the coated and one on the uncoated, it's very hard to tell. And if you're gonna make a big book, an expensive book, why not do something small and inexpensive to give yourself the best roadmap that you possibly can? And again, I don't look at that as a hassle. I look at that as a relief because I'm like, oh, a 20 page soft cover is like 12 bucks and I can print one on each paper, paper type and then I'll know exactly what my work looks like on that paper. So when it comes time to make the big book, it's actually more fun because I know I'm not flying blind. I'm like, hey, I got a roadmap here. I did my testing. I know I'm set on my paper. And in that same test book, you're experimenting with the typography as well and the page design. So that when that little test book comes back, it is the blueprint for what the big book will become. And totally. for 12 bucks, for 12 bucks, that's not a bad uh, investment. Well, Dan, why don't we open up the uh, chat here for questions? Because you've hit your, your five points, right? Hey, that's shameless advertising. Okay. <laughs> um, what do you got back there? You got some new equipment, right? Um, the camera is mine. The lens is not. That is a that is a Fujinon Cine lens. Oh, yes. It does look like a Cine oh, lens. Oh, and it's Those really are pretty, nice. It has, pretty the elements cool. are so smooth. Yeah, that is hot. that could be a little a, foreshadowing, by the way. Not not hmm. ruling out. Hmm. I use this a lot too, and this is my new thing that I haven't really in, tested yet, which is my Leica glass on this little full frame Sony. I'm very very anxious to try this because, you know, I shot Leica for 25 years, and I love the Leica film cameras, but I've never had a full frame digi small digi cam until now so i'm going to hopefully get out over the next few weeks and actually try to shoot something decent and there you've heard it folks dan milner talking about gear appreciate yeah. it while you hear it you're not going to hear it very often but no nope. right here right now just show me the negs you know this is all all fine and dandy until someone says show me the negs and then you get the cold sweat because yeah. if, if you ask me for my negs right now i would say i don't have anything that's Ouch. a terrible feeling. Terrible feeling. Okay, guys, throw your questions for Dan in the chat about going to print. This is a, a, a great series. The five points. Let's hit them again just real quick. What are those five points, Dan? The five, in fact, five can we see? Double. Maybe you could illustrate it with your... Yeah, there we go. Kaboom. Whoops. That's right. You never you get the camera angle right. Anyway. Uh, there you go. You're getting close. What the do you have there? Are, what is that photograph of, by the way? That photo is from something called Yamadas, which is a, an event that happens every year in Uruguay, which is a celebration of some of the African heritage that came to Uruguay. Um, and it's these processions that go through the streets and they do this thing called Candombe, which is a kind of music they play, a drumming and dancing that goes along with Yamadas. And those are women getting prepared to be in the procession. I shot that with my Leica and the 50 mil, which is sort of my documentary mode of choice. And um, that was a project I did with the Hasselblad with color and the Leica with black and white. And uh, nice. that was in 2012 or 13, I think. And uh, yeah, the points are, yeah. Number, number one, take a deep breath and realize this is supposed to be fun. 
Um, number two, digital asset management. Make sure you've got a handle on where you're storing your files and how to retrieve them. Number three was editing, tight, tight, tight. Number four is design the cover last. And number five is don't be afraid of the test book. Awesome. Now, you guys, this is your chance. I know you've got questions. We haven't answered every question that you have. So throw them in the chat and we'll, we'll get to them. You know, it's funny. I think print, anytime I do something about print, I would say that the, the engagement is, I would say, 50% of what it is when I talk about photography. And I think there's a reason for that. And I think print, even for someone like me, even for some of my friends who are even more skilled at publishing than I am, print is a magnifier as much into what you don't know as what you do. And photography is very simple in comparison. So photography is easy because the gear is sexy and people love talking about that and the image people love talking about images and photography is very simple compared to publishing. And so publishing for me is a window into things like typography and design, which I still struggle with. And so the engagement is often much harder to, to garner because, you know, people are like, ah, I don't want to work that hard. Or, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. And so it's hard for me to even talk about it. But it's just, you know, we all have to start somewhere. I've certainly gotten way better at it than I was when I started. And but I still when I have big projects, I always look to partner with designers and people who know more than I do, because it just Agreed. makes it more fun. It makes it more Absolutely. fun. OK, we've got a couple of questions. Charles here asks the question, what monitor calibration do you recommend for photographers that don't have an editor and prefer to edit and print? Yeah, monitor calibration is, um, I'm a big X-Rite fan, and yeah. X-Rite makes a lot of different kinds of calibrators that are very simple and inexpensive, that are easy to use, that take literally a matter of minutes that'll calibrate your monitor. And, and keeping your monitor calibration, you know, monitor calibration is essential. That's like a very, we're not, you know, the, the points I gave were basically even prior to getting to the to the point where you're going to be calibrated. If, if I was going to do a, a, a six through 10 list of points, monitor calibration would be in there. Um, and I use a little color monkey, you know, x right color monkey calibrator. It's very simple. Um, and the second thing to keep in mind with your, ca your calibration is your monitor density, because most of us, including me, sit in front of Apple monitors of one flavor or another. And oftentimes we have the brightness turned all the way up. You know, I'm in a room right now with two enormous windows that are pumping light in here. And so my monitor is jacked all the way up. Mm. Well, that's not necessarily the best solution for printing because I'm pushing so much light through this monitor and the images look beautiful, but there's not, there's no paper on earth that will hold that kind of information. So you're basically taking a color space like Adobe RGB and you're trying to print onto a piece of sRGB, uh, onto paper that's an sRGB color space. And you know, Adobe's out here and sRGB's in the middle. And so I see people looking at images online with their saturation slider way far right, their contrast way far right, and they're sitting in front of a monitor with the brightness turned all the way up. And I just look and say, that's not gonna print. They're gonna get dark prints. And then they're gonna be frustrated because they didn't get what they saw on their monitor. So yeah. density, density and calibration are, are very important. Here's another one from Hans, who is making a book right now on long distance running. I think you remember talking with him. Yeah, 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 yeah. How one, I was wondering how one selects the size of a book. I'm working on this endurance running book and I am undecided about the size. You know, Hans, that's a really good question. And the, when when I saw your name and I saw the distance running book, the first book, the first trim size that popped into my mind was a six by nine trade book. And I think your your book sort your book size is going to be dependent on what the goal of the book is. Are you making a single copy of a book for yourself, or are you making a book as a guide that you're going to sell to other people? Because if you're making a book for yourself, there's no holds barred. There's no rules. You could do you could do an 11 by 13 hardcover lay flat image wrap that's, you know, 250 bucks, but it's this gorgeous visual thing that you leave on your coffee table and your friends come over and go, Hans, man, you nailed it. This is a beautiful book. 
but there's no way you're going to sell a book like that to any sort of sizable group of people. But a six by nine trade book, yeah, it's not as sexy in terms of paper types, materials, and, and like a an object itself. But it's a it's very inexpensive, and it's a completely viable tool to sell. So the goal of the book will dictate the materials and the trim size and how the book is printed, whether that be print on demand one at a time or an offset run. If you've already got an audience of people who have said, yes, Hans, I'm signing up to your newsletter and I want to pre-order this book. And all of a sudden you've got 500 or a thousand pre-orders, then you can print that book offset and save yourself a boatload of money. Um, and instead of having to print them POD. So it's really the goal. You start with the goal of the book and you work backwards. So I'm a huge fan of small portable books. Look, I think Endurance Runner, and I have friends who do this. I run as well, but I'm too old to like do any serious endurance running. But I see endurance people all the time and they're obviously very thin, very fit. But when they travel, they also seem to be very minimalistic in their approach to travel very small bags, very few items. They want to be fast and mobile. And I see a book like a 6-9 trade that would easily fit into an away bag or a, or a shoulder bag or a backpack that they could actually take with them. That seems like a smart move to me. But again, it's, it's up to your individual goal. Here's one from Chris. What advice do you have for photojournalist, documentary photographer who recently moved to a new state? How can one get work there? Uh, that's a really good question. So photojournalism, I would separate photojournalism and documentary work into two categories. So when I think of photojournalism, I think of news institutions and organizations. So you're talking about newspapers and wire services. And to, a, to some degree, you're talking about agencies as well, like Getty in particular. So Getty has still has a news division. And their their Getty photographers are out covering like world events, and you have you have uh, local papers, and you have state newspapers, and then you have the wire services. So with those organizations, it's a pretty simple um, reach out to say, look, uh, you know, I'm here now, I'm based here, I'm a freelance photographer, I'm looking for work, and you can maybe start stringing, or if you're lucky, you can you can get some sort of contract to work with those folks. Documentary work is a whole separate category because documentary work often doesn't have a news angle to it necessarily and also doesn't have a time element. Most news photography is very specific to the moment and the day. Like, for example, I don't know what's happened earlier today. Um, oh, the heat wave or the fires. Right. So that's a that's a right now kind of story and assignment. If you are in Oregon right now, driving around in these remote places, photographing the fire, those are viable images in the news cycle. Um, if you're driving around Oregon to spend a year photographing why we have forest fires, that would qualify to me as a documentary project because you're sort of there before, during, and after the catastrophe. And you're saying you're, you're, you're basically trying to explain to the rest of us why these conditions exist. Why are the fires that bad this year? That's a documentary thing. That's a little harder but also the clientele varies much more. So let's say, Chris, that you're in, you're in Oregon and these fires are happening and you say, well, I'm not really, I don't wanna go out to the front lines. I'm not a news photographer, but I, I'm, I'm curious, I, I wanna tell why these fires are happening. Now you're talking about forest management. You're talking about all of the companies that are involved on an on a equipment level, fire engines, winch companies, aircraft companies, um, the state's marketing them, the state itself has a tourism division. All, you know, now you're branching out into all the companies that are associated with that project. They all become viable clients. And I'll give you an example. I went to a photo agency once in San Diego and the owner was this very eccentric dude. And when I met him, he was sitting at a computer looking at an image of a kayaker in, in, in the harbor in San Diego. And the photographer shot that as a kayaking photo, like it was an adventure sport photo. And it was, you know, late afternoon light. It was the classic, you know, kayaker with all the sailboats and the tugs and everything behind him in the harbor and then the skyline of the city. It's kind of a classic cliche kind of image. But the guy who was the photo editor at the ran the agency, he was calling the winch company on the tugboat. So he saw the tugboat in the background. He saw the winch on the front of the tugboat and he said, that's my client right there. 
So I, he looked, he didn't give, he didn't care about the kayaker. He just looked at the image overall and said, okay, it's beautiful. And the winch company, maybe they don't even have any images of their winches or anything like this. And so yeah. that really opened my eyes to how to get work was to look at a far broader umbrella than the actual image itself. So figure out what it is you want to do, whether it's news photography, documentary, or both. The new stuff is more classic, easy to or easier to approach. Not to say it's easy to get work, but at least you know where the traditional avenues lie. And then the documentary stuff is where things get broad. Cool. Here's back of me. Is there a difference between MagCloud and Blurb? Is it a subsidiary? I've been a little confused when creating and ordering. Maybe you can clarify Yes, there, there are two companies under the umbrella of another company, RPI, but they are very different companies. I actually wrote a post on my website which is shifter.media. And I did a comparison between Blurb and MagCloud. They are different companies with a different product line. I would not say that one is better than the other, depending, depending on what it is you want to do. One is going to be a better fit than the other. But the product line, the, the product lines are very different. MagCloud is in some ways incredibly streamlined and limited in terms of choices. And that's why I love it so much because MagCloud is very inexpensive. The products are fantastic. Dirt cheap. I absolutely love MagCloud, but it's very different from Blurb. If you want a high-end coffee table book, you can't use MagCloud. If you want a little dollar twenty eight page soft cover digest that you're going to use as a promotional mailer, MagCloud is the way to go. So it just takes a little bit of experimenting. Sit down, look at what the product offerings are. Um, how you make the products, the software paths that you take are also totally different. I think Blurb wins in that category. MagCloud is a bit wonky in the sense that there's some old school ways of making things, but it's primarily InDesign, Photoshop. Those are the, I use InDesign when I make MagCloud and I use Blurb BookWrite for the most part when I make Blurb publications. Again, my, my MagCloud secrets are the digest which is a five and a quarter by eight and a quarter soft cover, one paper type, one cover type. They're beautiful and inexpensive. I use them as my business card. And I also love the eight by eight square. Those two are my favorites on the MagCloud platform. My blurb favorites are magazine and trade books. Um, and those are one and two interchangeably. I make a ton of those. Um, I do also love the lay flat. If I'm going to make a portfolio, I did a van life portfolio last year that looks absolutely gorgeous. It was expensive, but man, it looks good. And if I was trying to get work as a photographer, I'd be using that book all the time. And so it really is going to be again for bocce. It's going to be picking, finding, determining the goal and your budget, and then working back to find the materials. Cool. We'll take a couple of more here. Uh, here's one from Victor. Seeing as most photography in the online space is very narrow in its story and context, how could one approach a project that makes it interesting for an online audience? Dan, you're the right one to ask this question. Best wishes from Serbia. So, hey, I'm on my way to Albania here in two months from now. So I'll be in your neighborhood. And Victor, you, you smoking a butt on his, uh, on his avatar photo. You got to love the commitment. <laughs> Um, yeah. Victor, it's a great question because I think there's a lot of people, even up to the highest levels of photography, that are wondering the exact same thing. I think what you're seeing now, and this happened, it's, it's grown exponentially in the last two weeks because of Instagram saying that they were going to go away from being a still photography uh, platform to a motion platform that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. A lot of people who've invested just insane amounts of time and energy into that platform. I think those people are crazy, but, um, and a lot of people now are saying, Hey, will people even look at websites anymore? Will they even look at blogs anymore? Are we too far down the rabbit hole? I think that, and, and the answer in my mind is yes, they will, because there's a, not everybody will, but there's a subset of people who are agitated by short form content, the, the, the nails on the chalkboard of social media the phoniness, all that stuff. And they're looking for something else. And I know this for a fact because I have a website. I have a site called shifter.media and I have a, an audience of people who, who go there. They don't want to go to social media channels. They want a conversation about things as opposed to a soundbite. My advice to you is this. Number one, be honest. Number two, be humorous. And number three, make the best possible, most personal work you can make. It is the only hope you have. 
it's the only hope that any of us have is to make the most unique, original work we can that's adding to the global conversation. That's not just a retread or a copy of what we've seen on some social thing that got popular. You want interesting, unique work and you want to deliver it with honesty and humor, regardless of what the subject matter is. Humor is, is in, in short supply in the photo world. There's a lot of ego, a lot of insecurity, and a lot of people conforming to what everybody else is doing. And I think because I try to be humorous when I deliver things, and I get a lot of people reaching out that said, look, they, look, they say, look, I may not even love your work, but I appreciate the fact that you're not taking yourself too seriously. You can take your work seriously, but don't take yourself seriously. And good for you, you quit smoking. That's a smart move. Um, we need you around. If you're going to be making pictures, we can't have you smoking. We got to have you out making pictures. We need a healthy Victor. There so, you go. Uh, that, that's what I would do is I would build a site, I think, and you can build a site now for virtually nothing. Keep it very, very, very simple and just consistently post when you have something to say with humor and honesty and and you will find an audience. There, there, there are audiences out there starved for this kind of information. Okay, I think we'll take one or two more. Cristiano from Brazil. Hey, awesome. Sorry, there are no amateur questions here, by the way. So when you're printing a book, what's the best advice to make it reach others such as newspapers and media? Um, newspapers and media are a hard nut to crack now because newspapers and media have a whole separate agenda. Mo most of them have an editorial policy and it's not a very it's not a very comforting world out there. I think you're better off building a site. You can use your social channels in conjunction with the site if that's something that you want to do. I see people doing that a lot. Um, but I think you're better off building your own audience and finding there is you know with the internet you have a, you have a direct connection to a global audience and the global audience is far more forgiving and far more far less fickle than the media and and newspaper world is. Um, I've worked inside of the newspaper world. I've worked inside of the media world and it is, it is a strange place and it's getting, it's getting stranger. Um, and there's a lot of policies that have nothing to do with actual news or truth. It's based on corp corporate ownership and all kinds of things. I don't even know how I would go after someone like that now, but the cool part is I, w I don't need to. I don't need any, all of the traditional channels that used to control information newspapers, media, publishers, if you choose to work with them, you can. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. You can build, I mean, Brazil is a country of how many people? How many, you know, millions and millions and millions. I've only been once, I loved it. Brazil is like, Brazil is like sticking your finger in a power outlet when you're plugging something in and you accidentally hold the metal parts and you shock yourself. That's what Brazil was in the best possible way. Mm. It left and it left an indelible print on my mindset. So you've got a country of millions of people right in front of you. So you don't necessarily need to connect anything to the traditional sources. You can build your own. You can live on your own in your own ecosystem. All right, we'll take one last uh, from Hans again. What options does Blurred offer to make books look and feel different than the mainstream? What options does Blurb offer? Well, you can do custom books. I mean, you can do books with linen covers and printed end sheets and foil stamping and debossing and embossing and placeholder ribbons and checkerboard head and foot bands. And we've done right. custom books for years. Um, it's something that a lot of people don't know about. Um, my, my advice to you is the work inside the book is where it starts. The book itself is an object. Yes, the materials are important, but if the work inside isn't good, no, it doesn't matter. Um, I've seen plenty of custom books that were beautiful objects and terrible books because the author just didn't put the time in to make a project that was interesting. And so it's a balance. If you, if you have a great body of work, um, the, other, the, the, the cheap workaround, the inexpensive workaround is to do a POD book at Blurb and then customize it yourself after the fact. I've seen people doing that for years. Uh, people will take a Blurb book, they'll strip off the hardcover, they'll deboss the linen cover themselves. They'll tip a print in. I've seen all kinds of modifications of blurb books over the years, mostly in small runs. So an author will order 10 or 20 copies of a book. 
They will modify it themselves after the fact. They'll tip a print in, they'll have a presentation case made for it, and they'll sell them for 500 to 1500 bucks a piece. So there's a lot of workarounds. Dan, we've covered a lot of ground, and I really appreciate you joining us all the way from Sag Harbor. Hey, it'll be cool if we can catch up with you again on your road trip. You're out for another, what, four or five weeks? I am. I'll be, uh, I'm here for another four or five days, and then I head to Maine for a couple of weeks. So I'll be more than happy to check in up there. Let's do it. I'll be in my bug net. In the bug net. We want to avoid those ticks and <laughs> what yeah. we were talking about before the show. Anyway, yeah. thanks, amigo. Love having you on the show. Thanks for answering these questions. We'll catch up Absolutely. with you soon. Absolutely. Thanks to everyone and uh, Mark and Jared. Thank you again. And I will see you guys soon. See you. See you, Dan, the man. All right. Adios. Always, always great to have Dan with us. And thank you guys for your questions. I think we got to most of them. There's a few that we didn't, but uh, we'll, you know, we'll pick those up next time. We'll have to bring Dan back. That's we'll just have to the bring answer. Dan back. So the most important takeaway here is do it. <laughs> You've got those five points he, he made. But the most important thing is you just really, really got to do it. I'm going to encourage you that it is not fulfilling until you get your work shared out to the world. And what really one of the best ways to share your work is to put it into print form. Brings you back to what I mentioned at the beginning with our um, sponsor with Bay Photo. Get prints made that you put on the wall. You can make blurb books. You can... There's a lot of ways that you can get your work out there, but the important thing is you do it. It's a little bit like having stage fright. You know, you're, you go, you're about to go out and make a, a talk or performance or whatever, and there's always this jitteriness. But that's actually energizing. And, and you know, until you put yourself out there, you just don't know what's going to happen. And usually it's good. I mean, I, I haven't yet had tomatoes thrown at me when I'm out on stage and I haven't had people, you know, complain about my work when I put it into exhibits and it's really thrilling to do that. And it, it brings together all these elements of sequencing and putting your photos together and editing in them that are so important. That's what we're doing on AYP plus, by the way, just to let you guys know. And I notice a lot of you guys from AYP plus are here is that we are taking our projects over the summer and we're sharing them every week with the class and getting feedback. Like you are getting real time feedback on your work. This is so important. Uh, even including maybe if you cropped it this way or you ch change it from a black and white to a color or vice versa. And you get a chance to show a, a, a group of like-minded photographers what your work looks like. And that's invaluable. You've got to be able to do that. You've got to be able to be around your your trusted companions along this photographic journey. And Jared, why don't you stick a link in there? Because I'd love to see you guys join AYP Plus. Yeah, grab that right now. We will see you on Tuesday. Okay, well listen, my birthday is tomorrow. And uh, I plan to start celebrating. I actually started last night. Um, it's a big birthday for me, too. I'm also going to be sitting down tomorrow. And, and I take the opportunity of my birthday, since it's kind of halfway through the year, I'm going to do my own new goal setting. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of stuff that I'm, I'm really going to be focusing on. So it's, it's a time that I find really pleasurable to really take a look at where I want to go from here. Thank you, Penelope. And I'll be talking to you tomorrow, actually, on my actual birthday. Today is birthday Eve, uh, but we're getting close. Thank you, guys. All righty. Well, listen, um, have I left anything out except to remember to subscribe and enable the bell? That's really important so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. We will be having great guests like Dan Milner on with us and some others coming up soon. Um, I love to see you guys in AYP+. Plus. I think Jared's put a link in there. You guys can check it out after the show. And uh, remember, just say this with me. Thank you. I love all your birthday wishes. Thank you again. Remember, say it with me, okay? Want to hear you guys all the way from Brazil. 
Uh, remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Capture life. Okay, love you guys. See you soon. Have a great weekend. Take care. All right. You know, I forgot to tell you guys to like and leave your comments in the actual video. Share the video. You'll see this in an edited form coming up soon. Okay, see you again. go on TV. Hey, look who's here. Guest appearance. This is River Silver. Ah, if you guys are still tuned in, you get to see the river dog. Ouch, 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 ouch. Well, she's, she's very a, excited. She's a bundle of energy. River, look, look in the camera. Who's that dog right there? Who's that puppy? Do you know that puppy right there? Do you see that puppy? We're not kind of looking in the camera. She is a bundle of energy right now. She's such a great dog. 11 weeks old and already has learned how to sit and do all kinds of stuff. Right, River? Okay, just wanted to show you guys kind of added bonus for sticking around. <laughs> we'll throw this in AYP club <laughs> ah, for those that yeah. missed it. <laughs> yeah, there's the River Dog and she's biting away. Okay, guys, see you soon. <laughs>